Uh, third selection I'd like to read is, um, is really my favorite. It's by uh, George Vasey, who was a, a very uh, talented writer who has written for many publications besides the uh, New York Times, for which he still works. Um, I think it's unique because he, he humanizes the event. He, uh, he takes the, uh, the facts of the matter and he turns it into a human interest story and really gives you a better picture of the person and his family and his culture. Um, it's called Carrying the Torch, and it was published September 16, 1988. Outside the huge apartment complex, women are selling fruit and washing down the sidewalks. From an unseen apartment, a Buddhist man is chanting his midday ritual. It appears to be a blessing, a blessedly mundane day in this giant city that has sprung from the rubble. But at closer glance, there is something different about this day and this week and this year. Uh, in this Pacific courtyard, kind of a forest hills on the Han, a shuttle of hired cars keeps parking in front of one long building with camera crews and Korean interpreters and journalists pressing the, the button of one particular elevator. Korean people already know of this man who lives on the seventh floor. As a young volunteer at the Olympic Village put it the other day, he is our hero. By tomorrow, tonight in the U.S., all the world will know of the man who lives on the seventh floor. On worldwide television, they will see a 76-year-old man, sturdy and proud, carrying the Olympic flame for the last lap inside the Olympic Stadium, handing it to three youngsters for the ceremonial lighting of the torch. For 52 years, Son Ki Chung has carried the flame in his heart, seeking to undo what he considers an injustice to himself and his people. The final redress has yet to come, but he is closer than he has ever been. When the Olympic flame is carried for the final lap, all the world will be reminded that the man who won the marathon at the 1936 Olympic Games in Berlin was Son Ki Chung, a Korean, and not a Japanese. That is why the Japanese television crews are the greatest irony and a different kind of honor for the robust man on the seventh floor. They ask me the same questions everybody else does, he says with a smile the other day, and I give them the same answers I give everybody else. His wife, Sung Yong Suk makes coffee for everybody. A dozen pairs of shoes are placed inside the door. Uh, there are Japanese in one room, English in another, Yanks in a third. They talk about marathons. But Song Ki Chung tells his story with great delight each time, making eye contact with people speaking other tongues. His strength and joy are more rejuvenating than a kilo of Jin Song. He has been preparing for this day for 52 years, diligently taking an hour of exercise each morning and hiking in the mountains, the national recreation, he has been training for the last lap. Ever since Korea was chosen for the Olympics six years ago, come down to one single hope and dream. This thing is for everybody. The details are known to most of the 41 million Koreans, how the Japanese occupied Korea, turning it into a truck farm for their broad ambitions. They did not steal food, Son said. They took it for less than cost. He was a young dropout with great skill for endurance running. So that he could gain more competition, people have prevailed on him to enroll in high school at the age of 19 when his peers were already in college or out working. He dominated marathons in Korea and Japan, and the Japanese entered him in the 1936 Olympic Games under a Japanese name. He won the race, and standing on the pedestal in front of the world, he lowered his head in silent protest against wearing the, Jap the rising sun on his uniform. The Japanese were not amused. He had an audition with Adolf Hitler, but could not bring himself to ask to be recognized as a Korean. When the games ended, he chose to never run again and spent the last nine years of the occupation going to law school for a while and then working in a bank. Later, the Korean War raged up and down the peninsula. Survival was more immediate than rewriting the Olympic record book. When peaceful times came, his Olympic fan mail continued to be forwarded by Japanese associations toward whom he holds no rancor. By now, it is the system that is the problem, not the former occupiers. Son and the Korean people began raising the issue of listing him as Korean in the official records, but the International Olympic Committee, which can change eligibility rules, admit millionaire professionals, and the flash of a television contract has merely taken 52 years to do nothing about Son Ki Chung. But Son is a long distance man. After his soul was awarded the 1988 Games, he was invited to Los Angeles in 1984 where Peter Uberoff and his associates honored him as one of ten athletes during the final ceremonies. He was introduced as a Korean. Among his treasures in his apartment, the gold medal that has been given to a youth organization, is a photograph of a plaque in Culver City, California, listing all the Olympic marathon winners. His nationality is engraved as Korean. He observed the number of Korean-born people in Los Angeles, and he said, 
I was happy to see them live so well. America is a good country. The other day, Song Ki Chung went to his closet and displayed his pale blue 1984 Olympic jacket. It is the only outfit he wears to major sporting functions, he said. The other, um, in the opening ceremony, however, he will wear the uniform of an athlete once again. He is proud that he will turn over the flame to three young people. His race is almost over. When somebody asked if Saturday would belong to him, Song Ki Chung laughingly put up his dukes, looking more like Jack Dempsey than a marathon man. He said to the interpreter, you shouldn't even be asking that. His oriental sense of unity transformed the room. How did he think he would feel when he carried the torch around the stadium? He said, I'm already crying. The whole crowd will be in tears. But for the moment he was smiling on his way to the next room, running his long race for the recognition not of himself but of a people. Okay, the last selection I want to read is um, from the San Diego Union Tribune, and it's August 10, 1992. Uh, it's, it's about the Barcelona Olympics um, and the last one that uh, Song Ki Chung attended. Uh, it's called Korean Marathon Wipes Out the Masquerade of 1936. In 1936, Song Ki Chung won the marathon in the Berlin Olympics. He is Korean, but when he stood on the podium, he was forced to wear a sweatshirt with the emblem of the Japanese occupiers of his country. And the Japanese flag was raised and the Japanese anthem played. Last night, 56 years later to the day, Hwang Young Cho of South Korea won the Olympic marathon. The South Korean flag was raised and the Korean anthem, South Korean anthem played. And standing at attention in the Stadi Olympic was a, a Korean man named Song Ki Chung. He is 80 years old. I am very proud, said Wong, and mo very moved. Son arrived in Barcelona the day before the uh, marathon, tra uh, marathon, traditionally the final event of the Olympics. He came because he thought Wong had a good chance to win, and he didn't want to miss it if he did. Yesterday morning, Son went to the athlete's village and sought, and sought out Wong. They spoke briefly, Son imparting these words of advice. The only way you can win the race is to have mental power. Wong apparently listed, uh, listened. These are a cruel, merciless 26.2 miles. The course starts by the Mediterranean and winds its way past monuments through ancient streets and climbs 180 feet up over Muntajik over the final three miles. Heartbreak Hill, the legendary conclusion to the Boston Marathon, climbs about 130 feet. And the temperatures of race time were in the mid-80s. Huang stayed with the lead pack for the first half of the race, then hung on as it dwindled at mile 15, mile 17, and mile 19. At mile 20, he broke away with one other runner, uh, Koichi Morishita of Japan. The two ran side by side for the next five miles, gritting their teeth, fighting fatigue, carrying the burden of history on their shoulders. Huang said he got nervous because Morishita kept looking at him. Perhaps he would not have minded or noticed if Morishita were not from Japan. With slightly more than a mile to go, Huang became mentally powerful. The course had reached the peak on Montujic, where there was a short downhill before stretched before the final climb to the stadium. Wong went. Morishita did not go with him. Wong crossed the line in two hours, 13 minutes, 23 seconds, and collapsed. His body had expended every ounce of water, every molecule of oxygen, and his legs were cramping severely. He was removed from the track by stretcher and gave it, given a deep massage. I wanted to run another lap, a victory lap with the Korean flag, Wong said. He was 22 years old. It's a shame I could not. Thirty minutes later, however, he stood on the podium watching his flag go up a pole. Morishita was second in two hours, 13 minutes, 45 seconds, and Germany's Stefan Freigang was third. Japan's Hiromi Taniguchi, the 1991 world champion, finished eighth after falling and losing a shoe midway through the race. The top American was Steve Spence in 12th place at 215.21. In 1936, we won the marathon under the Japanese flag, said uh, Chung Bangsu, Hwang's 56-year-old coach. Since then, we've never won. Many times I've been asked why Japan and other nations were winning and we weren't. I thought we just needed to be patient and eventually we, we would win. When I heard the Korean anthem tonight, I had a lump in my throat and tears fell from my eyes. Imagine how Song felt. As a, a postscript, I might add that um, uh, Song Ki-chung um, 
died at the age of 90 at midnight on November 15, 2002, from pneumonia, and he was buried at Daejeon National Cemetery. Afterwards, the Son Ki Chung Memorial Park was established. Thanks to all of you for coming out, and Jerry, thank you especially for preparing such a nice program for us. And it's a great tribute for Asian Pacific Heritage Month um, to remember these folks. So thanks to the committee for choosing a great topic. Um, I hope you all can come out. We've got two more programs this quarter, and if you're a fa fan of Joy Luck Club, uh, we have two wonderful readers reading from Joy Luck Club next week, um, Judy Wu from the History Department and Georgina Dodge, um, who's an assistant provost, and they're both really wonderful readers. So if you have some free time, you're invited to come join us, and have a good rest of your week. Thanks so much.